All right. Well, welcome to all of you. And I am sorry that my co speaker is not here, so I will fill in for him and make sure that you get the didactic portion that he was responsible for. And I am needing about a second to set up here. So again, if you were in my master seminar yesterday and heard this, I'm hoping you'll stay for the, the 20 some minutes or so to hear um, the saline aspects of, of what I have to say. Um, okay, I have no financial disclosures because I don't make any money on anything. I give everything to charity. Uh, l understanding aging, there, it's not a one paradigm fits all type thing. You know, you, we, we see aging from a, a, from a volume perspective, a rightage perspective, skin dyschromias, gravity, but volume has really become a core understanding for me from youth until death. And it, it really is an, a, a, a component to all of, all of aging from the, from the very earliest onset. We'll, we'll track that as we go forward. If you look at Sharon Stone in her early uh, 20s to her mid 40s, you can see that it looks like she's got brow drop. There's, de uh, there's descent of the brows. When in fact, if you look, they really haven't fallen. And if you look at the, the, the brow itself, the, excuse me, the upper eyelid portion, there is a little bit of drop on one side and there's a little bit of actual uh, ascent on the other side. So I'm not saying I don't do skin removal, I do. I just don't do, take fat out from the upper eyelid and I don't do brow lifts anymore. So for me it's a volume plus or minus a little bit of skin removal. The reason is I look at the brow like a balloon that deflates. And so when you reinflate that balloon, you create to me something very nice. All I have to do is look back at um, youth. The, the problem, and if I can give you some take home pearls, because a lot of times you're going get, to get so much information into your brain that you're not going to go home with anything pertinent. Here is a pertinent one. Be careful of the anterior cheek. It's probably the, 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 the most enamored thing we had about, uh, I would say five years ago, everyone presented on how, it's, how lovely it is. To me, it's the place I stay away from. And the reason is fat retains well there. There's a dynamic problem when people smile, it goes into the cheek area and it looks weird. So I'm moving to the perimeter. I'm going to go into a much greater detail in a subsequent talk with a 10 minute uh, uncut video that will show you how I do it. Because I, I think a lot of times when you have edited video, you don't get a snapshot. You get a snapshot, but you don't get the full breath as if you were standing in my office watching me do the work. So the next thing, the next thing is I, I want to talk about is fat is bioactive. It's so important that you understand this. This is another take home pearl. Fat is not bioinert, it's not a HA. It is something that if you gain significant weight, it will make you look fat. So that's something that you need to know that this is not a stuff, stuffing material. And that's really important. The other thing is people tell me fat lasts like two years or three years. I don't know what that arbitrary number comes from because it's contrived. Because if you think about a skin graft, when a skin graft is placed, it has blood supply and it stays. Right? It's not going to get up and walk away, but a portion of the fat may resolve, resorb and disappear, but the rest will, per, will persist. This is a lady, I know it's a gross image, but I took it out, uh, I opened her lip to try to fix an overdone lip 10 years out. She said she had silicone. Well, in fact, it wasn't silicone. I said, this is all fat. Did you have fat grafting? She says, oh yeah. And I gained a, a lot of weight and the lip got weird. So I cut out the fat. And this is 10 years later. These are fat particles. So people think it's a scar tissue, it's bioinert, absolutely wrong. If you can remember a couple things that are important, it's bioactive and it's permanent. Other thing, a lot of people try to get perfection out of fat. I want you to understand not only the benefits of fat, but the limitations of it. If you use this technology and say, I will continue to stuff a face until it works, it won't because fat is soft. It's a mattress foundation for the face. It's not going to correct rightids. It's not going to correct tear troughs perfectly. And you're going to get frustrated patients. You're going to get exhausted. I do a single session and then I use some fillers to touch it up, which again, I will elaborate on a lot of these points that I've cursor in a cursory fashion addressed. So the cannula is obviously the way I dress fat, but I think since October 2010, with the advent of the micro cannula, uh, it's really allowed me to do a lot more things in the office and continue to refine that aesthetic. So for me today, fillers has become the real way to, to do a lot of the, the bulk work. And even when I do fat, I touch it up with fillers. For the people that just entered the room, I'm giving my master's seminar yesterday because uh, the other gentleman that's with me has not shown up, so I'm doing that. So unfortunately, I have to listen to it again. Um, the, 
ideas of safety is so important. It's a preeminent concern when you're dealing with patients. And fillers, to me, are universally safe in a, in a way because they're bioinert. And fat has a little bit of risk. And the, fat, the risk is the bioactivity of the fat. So it's important that you understand that the younger you are, the less of a track record you have. For example, when I operate on a 20-year-old for hair transplant, I have risk because that guy's going to progress. I don't know his, I don't know his track, track record. But if he's 40 years old, I feel a lot safer. Same thing with fat. The older you are, the safer I feel you are. And I need to find out what your weight history is, especially in Texas where our diet is not as good. People fluctuate a lot. I want to make sure that you're a safe candidate to have fat grafting. Because if you tell me I just lost 100 pounds and I gained 100 pounds and I lost 100 pounds, you're probably going to need conservative HAs right? Hyaluronic acid instead of fat. So it's important you really understand that concept. So I just try to use models of, of communication with patients. This is one of them. I just take, say, a glass of water that's emptying. Um, and that is something that is a way that I can tell my patients is that, is it permanent? Fat is permanent, as I said, but you'll continue to age. So that glass of water emptying is understanding how I give you a certain amount of fat, but you'll mature and you'll probably need some fillers. And if I don't do fillers for you, um, I probably need to come back and do more fat for you, maybe five, ten years down the line. Um, being too full is a concept we'll address, which is if you think of a 20-year-old face, it's typically very, very robust in nature. And oftentimes we don't want that. So for me, it's about filling the, the fat to a point where you get a very good result. You change the blink where the patient looks better in a blink of an eye, but you haven't fixed all the problems. So if a patient comes in and says, I want fat grafting for these reasons, I want this address, this address, this address, forget it. What I help calibrate the perspective and calibrate the goal is say, my goal is that you look better. You're gonna look more attractive, you're gonna look more youthful, but what, what's the point of what we do anyways? Isn't it to make someone better in a social professional context? But oftentimes, particularly for women, when they take makeup off, they're looking at their face close up with an 8X magnifying mirror at 10 o'clock when, when the lighting is horrible, and they say, these are the reasons I need to see the doctor. And what they're failing to see is that, that does not contribute to the overall blink effect of how we interact with these, each other socially professionally. So I believe fat, if, you, if it's done well, it's safe and can deliver this, this subconscious connection and improved connection with a human being. But it's not gonna fix every flaw perfectly. It's not gonna do that. And I have to do fillers to make that better. And even then, I say it's an asymptote, meaning I approach perfection, but I never get there. So this is how I do it. I get fat uh, there, I let it mature, which we'll talk about what that means. And then I come back and do some filler touch-ups as I need to, because I tell every patient that. The difference between an education and an excuse, and education's told before you do it, excuse is the same words out of my mouth to your ears, but I said it after the procedure. So I like educations, and I try to, I burden you with education over and over. I have, I have a scribe in my office typing every educational point that I have, so they come back, you never told me. No, she hand wrote all that in my EMR as we talked, not just a, a, as a standard consult. So another paradigm of communication, a lot of times this material is so confusing, not only for the patient, but for us. So we need a point of communication. I use this bed paradigm, which, or model, I should say, which is we typically are uh, really understanding that the, the levels of the face, fat is like a mattress foundation. It provides a wonderful contouring for the face, but it doesn't knock out the duvet, which is gonna be, or, or, the, or the, the sheets. You know, these are the areas that fillers and, and neuromodulators are gonna be uh, modulating, because these are the areas that are too close to the skin. Fat is imprecise, you can't stuff it, and it's bioactive. So when I was in Columbia in 2007 giving a talk and saying, you know, be careful in a young patient doing it asymmetrically. Someone did a mandible reconstruction at 18 and when she was 24 it started to expand a little bit with weight gain and changes of metabolism. So don't use this to reconstruct things in an asymmetric fashion and think it's bioinert. I know I repeat myself a few times, but the key points I want to drive home because you're not going to remember everything I say. Uh, like replaces like. A lot of times we, we look at this and say, you know what, we've got to replace um, we, just get, we can just stick a chin implant, it's like a cheek implant. Well, I don't do a lot of che cheek implants at all because I think there's a problem with it in terms of infection and in terms of the, the, the invisibility of that implant over time. Chin implants I love for the person that has microgenia. I don't think fat can actually create that degree of, of projection. But if someone just has soft tissue loss, a chin implant will worsen it because you, you're, this is the area that is of soft tissue concern. So the envelope that, it, that loses over time is really disproportionate. In other words, if you look at the slide, you can see that 
we lose more soft tissue envelope and so the exposure of bone is really the principal ex manifestation of aging in my opinion. So let's go to a, a slide here and take a look at this. If there's soft tissue loss that's disproportionate to the hard tissue loss and then you go in there and you put an implant in, I believe that you actually get more bone exposure okay, or exposed implant. Whereas with aging, let's go back to that again, if you put fat grafting or fillers, you cover the bone, you cover the transition points. So like replaces like is an important thing. The other thing people always ask me after one of these talks, and I, I'm gonna try to circumvent some of that, but you're welcome to, because we have a little Q&A time, is how much the stem cells and all those things work. And there's actually some lectures I wouldn't mind attending later today about that. But honestly, I think there's a lot of voodoo. I tried PRP, um, all these things to try to increase take. And I, I, I will say that, I really don't want you, I'm going to show you my processing methods, but I don't want you to get enamored with that or think it's gospel because I think there's many ways to process, harvest and process it. The key is to be gentle and the key is not to overfill and the key is to set up expectations for patients. Not worry so much if I centrifuged it at a certain RPM a certain time or did I use a washing method. My colleagues, uh, the Glasgow's actually looked at it quantifiably different types of harvesting methods and found that there was almost negligible improvements uh, on, on, yes, maybe statistically significant, but we're talking about 63% take versus 60% take. It, it's, it, it, don't get obsessed with the take. Get obsessed with seeing the face better and delivering more aesthetically reasonable results that could need a little touch up. So going back to the paradigm of aging, so it's basically volumetric loss from birth to death, right? Think about it. If you think of a one-year-old, they have more fat than a five-year-old. Think of a 10-year-old versus a 15-year-old. Think of 20 to 25 and 30, 35. Given the metabolic constraint that we're all the same, we don't gain weight as we age, if we stay, stay the same weight, our face becomes progressively skeletonized. So what we need to do is revolumize it. But what is an ideal? If the evolution of that face is that we're too full, then what we try to do is achieve a better shape in a blink of an eye. The, the concept espoused by Malcolm Gladwell is that when we look at a face, is that face attractive? Is it youthful? Is it feminine? Is it masculine? We, so judge your work. I judge my work when I walk in the room and shake a person's hand. I either, I either got it or I didn't get it. I don't judge the uh, work by standing there going, I guess you do look better. No, I, I have a catalog in my brain of every patient I walk in, I go, I'm not there yet. And I, either, I tell my patients, if you don't get a compliment me from, I don't, I don't give any false compliments. I, I'm very blunt, as you probably can tell. I will either give you no compliments or five. <laughs> and if five, it means I'm really happy with my work. We could always improve things, but I'm happy. If I don't give you compliments, I'm not there yet. And it's using your right brain, engaging your right brain, your artistic brain to see where you are. So uh, lo loss is about shape change. So we go from two full round and we start to skeletonize and the oval is the ideal shape. And we're talking more about that in, in another lecture coming up. And that ovalization starts to become dominant in the lower face where it becomes the skeletonization occurs and then gravity. And, and so what we try to do is understand that that blink effect has a lot to do with facial shape. And so we try to do that. So this is a, a tease on a, a lecture coming up in about 30 minutes. So sit tight. Um, this is about shaping the face through triangulation. I have not presented this and I, I, I'm publishing it very soon. And this triangulation is an idea that I'm not going to go into now, but it's probably the most critical thing. You're going to see a video and I'm going to go through all these concepts very soon. So just going through this, uh, you can take a face that's heavy and balance it. You can take a face, in my opinion, that probably today I would have done just fillers on, but still got a decent result with this. A face that this is fat with a little bit of filler touch up. And I think in my le next lecture, I show you the, the, the sequence of, of improvement with fat and fillers. A face that I think looks good, but maybe a little bit too much in the anterior cheek. This is an older image. And same with this one, I think it's a good image, but maybe I would have downplayed the anterior cheek. And these are just concepts that have evolution of your aesthetic. And so it's important that when you hear me today, I'm not giving you gospel because my gospel changes. And this is understanding that when we're very volumetrically pleated, this is gonna be expensive to do that with fillers. And fat to me is free in the sense that I can do what I want, harvest what I want to get those results. And these are, again, just very volumetrically depleted faces that I think fill, fat is going to be the gold standard over fillers if possible. Understanding blink of using twins. The, if you look at the photo up on the top right, this woman in, instantly, you, when you look at her, she looks younger than her twin sister who's never had anything done on the left. But if you try to read what it is, 
the nasolabial grooves are the same, the brows are the same, uh, there's, you know, the lips are the same, all the things we try to read. Try, you know, what I do is I'll oftentimes look at mother daughters on Facebook or whatever it may be and try to figure out where is it? Or a celebrity that ages, what, what is it? I'm, if we don't start studying nature, we're gonna do arbitrary work. And so if you look at this, it's the shadows and light. That's all it is. And if you go back and look at her when she was 30, you can see that. It's, it, it, that's the softness that's there. Um, light. Light is everything. I encourage you to take photographs without flash, which I know is, sounds verboten, it sounds bad, it sounds against the grain. But the reason I encourage that is that you can't show volume with fill and flash very well. That's why you can't see your results. You can't show your results, patients aren't happy. And think about this, why is top-down light so important? Well, first of all, make sure your room is small so that the room is small enough that you don't have overshadowed faces, okay? You would need to work with it to get the right calibration of the room. I have a dedicated small room with overhead lights, no flash. And that's, but that's me. You may not want to do that, but if you're working with trying to establish volume in the face, that is the way to go. Now, wh why is that not cheating? Why is that, to me, actually more like real life? Because we live in a world where people look like Nick Nolte on certain bad lighting, right? But here's the reason why, it's down. The light comes down from above. And when light comes down, it looks like a deflationary element where our face deflates and the, and the shadows get worse. Because when we're younger, there's more convexity and the light shines better on it. So emulate reality. What is reality? If the beach, it's top down. Inside, it's top down. And so that deflation is really understanding how we read the face and how light interacts with the face and how transitions interact with the face. And that's what, we, I, you know, I constantly rethink things and that's important. Um, longevity, I do a lot of hair restoration, so when I'm, and that's my next course, if you, I encourage you guys to stay if you can. Uh, if you have, if you're interested, it's a, I'm doing a, a lot of, uh, uh, I'm doing the next hair workshop in this room. So this here is the concept that when I started to think about hair, I started to realize that hair as it evolves, actually starts to, be, to grow based on primary blood supply and osculation, secondary and osculation and neovascularization. And I started to look at fat. And so the thing is a lot of people look at fat, they go through that swelling period and go, it's gone. Well first, did you, you know, I had a lady the other day said, you know, I did some Juvederm in my lips and it's gone. I said, really? Let's take a photograph. Oh, it's still there. We have amnesia. All our patients have, you have amnesia, I have amnesia. Go back and take the photo and follow your patients out. When you're doing fat, before you jump in and stick more fat, more fillers, more stuff, let it have time to mature. Follow it over a period of time and see what occurs. I believe there's this trajectory where things get better over time, not always, but in general there's a dip and then a slight evolution of time. So if you look at a week, then you look at a month, there's just this evolution, follow, and if you're not taking consistent lighting photographs, you're not gonna be able to do any of this. But try to follow it over a period of time and see that it, not only does it not go away, but things are shaping. Now, I did do neuromodulators as well. That's the only other thing I did for her. Donor dominance is a, is a consideration that is in the world of hair restoration, which, which means that where you take the, 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 the uh, hair, it will behave like the, the native hair from the origin. Okay, so it's not gonna be susceptible to loss. Well, I believe taking the, the fat from the belly and thighs is great because it, it, it lasts, it persists, but it's also bad because it lasts and it persists. And so that's why you gotta be careful with weight gain. You gotta, be, you gotta pick your right patient and make sure that they understand that um, it, fat is weight susceptible. And that's one of the mo most important things. So I don't necessarily need to have improved take. I think that that is not a critical thing. I think the goal is to, to have that margin of safety for me with uh, fillers in the office. And that's just the honest truth. I mean, I think that we can have a purity of, of being a surgeon if you're a surgeon in the room and say, well, I will only carve it out surgically. And if we have that paradigm, I think we're gonna do a disservice because there's so many tools in our belt. The goal is to use as many tools that, are, that can be used safely and that work for a patient. Is that flickering? Okay, um, hopefully I'll stop doing that. All right, so just walking you through the procedure here. The, I mark the face out and for me it's important. What is going on there? Carlos, what's going on that thing? That's very annoying. But the, the idea is, uh, is really to, to look at the face as multi-shadow points. 
And the more shadows there are, the more that you want to manage this, whether it's with fillers or fat. And I think that's a critical element to this. And when we harvest, we want to go through a barrier in the inner, uh, inner thigh that we don't see the, 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 uh, the reflections of the cannula. That's an important point. This is all in the textbook. I don't make any money on this, so you know this is something that, and it's an old book, but if you want to get a book that's really easy, I, don't, I, I think that the, t the technique and the tools are pretty much the same. Um, th this, these are the set that's there for, for harvesting. Boy, that is going to be irritating with the video. All right. Should we, what should we do here, Carlos? Just let it go? All right. Was it doing it earlier? No? It's getting worse. Okay. Don't worry, it's only three hours of this, so this is no big deal. Just move your head quite very quickly in the same fluctuation, it will, it will actually work. No. Um, so we just harvest by hand. There's not, no trick with this 10cc lure lock syringe. You, then you put, put the cap on there on one side, take out the plunger, put in the, the, the back side there. You want to uh, centrifuge sterilely. I do 3,000 RPM, uh, three minutes. Uh, my colleagues may do 2,000 RPM. Some people do 1,100 RPMs. It doesn't really matter. I, I honestly don't think it matters. Um, but if, if you think it matters and it's, you've found good experience, hey, that's great. I mean, there's many ways to skin a cat. I don't want you to hear just because I've said something that that's gospel. There's many right ways to do this. And there's, of course, there's some wrong ways as well. Ah, hallelujah. After the st centrifuge is, sterile, uh, is done at sterile, you're going to get a supernatant and infranatant. And you're going to pour out, always pour the supernatant out first. Then you want to take the uh, infranate and drain that portion. I don't really um, place these little wicks in there. I think it's okay to have a little oil now, um, but you don't want any cotton fibers in there. Transfer over to 25 cc syringe. And then what you want to do is just make sure that it doesn't splatter across the wall. With the, uh, so let the fat column come down before you put the back end in, push it up, and then have a female-female uh, interface where you're going to transfer into 1 cc lure locks. Uh, these are different. Uh, the cannulas, I just use a 1.2 millimeter, so there's different types, but I, I like the tulip 1.2, and there's a 0 0.9. Again, everyone's going to have a different way. I used to use both. You find out which, which works for you. I don't like the 0 0.9. And this is just having um, an image of the patient so that I can go back to it. So people ask me, you know, how much of this design work is, is premeditated and how much of it is on this fly? Well, I do everything under general, and the reason I like to do that is the patients have anesthesia so that I don't have to put anesthetics in the face. It allows me a very quick turnaround time, less edema postoperatively, and ability to read the face more, uh, I think, correctly. And I premeditate probably about 70%, and I make some on-the-fly adjustments from what I'm seeing on the table, but it's hard to see it when they're in a supine position. So unfortunately, this is the art of, of doing this work and constantly evolving what you feel is safe, what you feel is beautiful with time. Um, so I just use the, the 1.2. Um, people ask me what depth I place this, and, and it's very easy. It's, 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 there isn't a right answer. They're all depths to me are pretty much okay. I go through a plane of least resistance, except when I'm working the lower eyelid, then you've got to release the arcus marginalis and go in a, in a very specific way. So I'll show you a short video of that. To me, that's the only technically challenging area, but it's easy to do. Um, and if you have a problem with doing this and a fear of doing it, start with some Restylane. Use the same cannula, same technique, and, 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 and release that orbital rim. If you, if you um, are still scared of doing it, come to St. Louis. I, I have a, I've been running a course. Um, uh, I've been, I actually don't run the course. Uh, faculty on a course with Mike Nyack there for almost a decade now. And uh, I don't make any money off that. Uh, no, actually, no, I do get an honorarium for that one. But if you come or not, it's not going to affect my money. But it is, it's just a, uh, a release of the, um, the orbital mar arcus marginalis. You've got to feel that release when you're doing this. I don't, you don't feel that release with fillers. You do feel it with fat to make sure in the right plane. And that's important. So I usually fill like one and a half cc's on one side. And then I come back and I fill like one and a half cc's on the other side. Um, and so that's my average. I don't typically put much more than that. You want to be conservative with the lower rim. You can always do a filler touch-up, as I alluded to multiple times. Uh, and then I just take my non-dominant finger, always protecting the glow before I enter. And then that's my feeling, how I can feel it go back. Now, uh, this is autoplay. Can you click that, Carlos? There's no audio here, so I, I will just, uh, for this one, there's no audio. So I, you just make sure that the, 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 the cannula dances back and forth across it. Just click, just touch the screen, it'll play. Okay, well, are you serious? 
There we go. All right, so you're just going back and forth and placing a, about a 50th of, of a cc, just little, little bits at a time. So I'm showing you here on the skin how my can is moving, just across the rim. It's, you're feeling this release of the arcus and you're above periosteum because the, the, the reflection of the periosteum coming up, because you can't get below the periosteum. I think that's just nonsense. And you're just feeling that release so that you stay in the right plane. I think that if you don't release that, you're going to deposit on one side or the other and you're going to create a problem. Always go perpendicular to the rim. If you go parallel, that's when people get the problems. When you see these things that make people scared of doing fat grafting is because it's a simple problem. Angle perpendicular to the lower eyelid, you'll be safe. It's not that hard. Start with an HA if you're fearful and you'll be okay. The outer canthus is important because the outer canthus, uh, when I started doing fat, I didn't do much in the outer canthus and I always had this little dip out here. Remember, th the rim is like this, right? So perpendicular means like this, right? So just access point. Who, where do you enter? Who cares? Just make it easy for yourself. So I just take a separate one for the outer canthus because I can't get... I can't get perpendicular to the outer canthus without going lateral. So I just go in there this direction like this to go in there. I put about a, ha a half a cc or so in there. And that's all you need. And then the nasal jugal groove, I think it's overrated, to be honest with you, and I think it's dangerous. Anything medial, when you're trying to bulk up the medial central face, be careful. That's my new pearl in the last three or five years, is slow down on anterior fills. So I put in half a cc. I mean, I even put anything in there. It doesn't matter to me. It's, it's irrelevant. Filling the, the brow, um, all you do is, is plane of least resistance. Fill it along the rim itself, maybe a little bit below the rim, a little bit above the rim, and just contour that area, about one and a half, two and a half cc's, Maybe three, that's probably aggressive. Start with one or two, see where you go, and see, watch your results. Uh, and that's the problem, with, just like a, a hair transplant, or like a rhinoplasty, or like a facelift, you, you don't know your results for many months to a year. You need to see that ev evolve. And for noses, it's years, right? And so this is a short video. Carlos, can you click that, please? This is what I call a plan of resistance. It's quite easy. And so what you're going to do is just enter on this side. Um, then the anterior cheek, as I told you, be careful. I, I would even tell you don't put anything in there unless they're very, if you see a skeletonized look, you're gonna put, probably put in a half or one cc, but I'm actually putting almost nothing in. The reason for that, besides the dynamic issue, because the retention is so high in the areas, when I fill the lower eyelid, there's already some changes to the lower eye, to the, to the anterior face, and when I build some out, outer cheek, there's some changes to the anterior face. I really now have gotten down to almost zero in the anterior cheek, maybe half a cc, rarely one, and in the past I was putting one and a half to two. You said, well, wait a second, one and a half to two, you've reduced to 0.5 and that's made a difference? Yes. It, 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 that one and a half and two, people think, oh, I really need six. That's gonna make me throw up, okay? But my one and a half and twos is bordering on too much. So I would really caution you to almost put nothing in. And that's why fat is, a, is an art, is not just a science, it's mainly art. And I know that the book that I wrote many years ago is about the, 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 the cookbook nature of it, but I believe there's an artistic element to see your fat. If anything, always undershoot. And then filling uh, lateral cheek, to me, that's the key. This is my gem of an idea that I want to deliver to you that I'm going to elaborate more in the next lecture or in two lectures from now. Filling the expanse of the outer cheek gives this gorgeous shape to the face. It doesn't have dynamic issues. And I put in here two, three, four, five cc's in the outer face. You know, people always want to ask how much I put in. And I blend it all out there, just arc, arcing across that outer face. Now, clearly, if someone's got a fat, heavy face with a huge malar bone, don't say Sam told me to put four cc's in there. Use your judgment. Maybe put one, maybe don't put anything. But understand that most people start to involute across where my hand is. And so now I'm putting a lot more in the outer face and a lot less toward the anterior. So the numbers that are in that book that I wrote many years ago, to me, are outdated. I think they're too aggressive. So um, th this is the buckle area. If they're really hollow, 
you can't fill enough in the area. But I would be cautious. Just be very, very cautious in this area if you're starting out. You heard me say that. Just put in maybe, you know, if, they, if they're really depleted, you could get four to six cc's. But if you are, on per, these are all per side numbers, by the way. They're not both sides. And, but if they're, you know, average, I'm putting in one, two cc's. Very, very little. Because most people don't need that much. And you said, well, how does that make a difference in the buckle area? That's so little. Because really, it's not about volume. It's about tapering shape. And, it's a, and, and that's the same thing I do with fillers. And maybe if the fat is scary to you, start, shape, start seeing the face. And you can do reversible fillers in the office to, to establish your aesthetics. And then you can progress toward a surgical permanent modality. And then this is just blending toward the outer face. That's all it's showing. And then blending uh, further down. I just divide the buckle into multi-zones. The pre-jowl area, always go below the mandible if they have a heavier jowl because you're going to try to capture that. Um, and then anterior chin to me is huge. Whether it's fillers or fat, that's what makes someone look old in my opinion. Uh, this is just the lateral mandible. But one thing is, as surgeons, if you're a surgeon in the audience, we typically look at things from a side angle, right? Facelifts from the side, even rhinoplasty, I'm still on the side looking like this, profile. The, the key is always go back and look at the frontal view because if you project the lateral mandible too far out, it's not going to look right. So you, we have to see and engage with the patient always from the frontal view. So it, whether it's fillers, fat, always go back and look at that view. Why is that so important? Why am I before and after is frontal view instead of three quarters, which people always say three quarter, three quarter, three quarter, because we read each other's faces. I'm reading all of your faces from a frontal view. You're reading mine from a frontal view. This is how we engage on a social professional level. So this is just filling it, how much, it all depends. I mean, so, I, most times I don't put anything here. Sometimes maybe two or three cc's. I know everyone's a, a obsessed with numbers and the numbers don't matter as much except to go low. That give you a framework of understanding. Filling nasolabial groove, in the past I thought you could fill this with impunity. If you listen to some of my lectures two years ago, today I feel it contributes too much to the anterior cheek. So I'm conservative here too. I can always come back and do a little filler here because I don't think the fat works that well in this area anyway. So if I'm putting in between one to three cc's total along this, and this is the nasal labial groove, the, the, the lower half of the portion of the, of the canine fossa. And there's a patient, I don't, I don't use bandages, I don't use um, compressors, compressors uh, stuff. I, this is what, I just, the patient goes home like this. And they do look freaky for seven to 10 days. They need to know that. So a take home lesson of the whole lecture is be artists constantly re-engage your work, constantly reevaluate is it good enough, what is wrong with it, and, and, and the way to do that is using your right brain. We're going to go on to the next lecture.